Last Sunday morning, we took the opportunity to recognize mothers and all that they do for us. I imagine many of us could say that we admire or that we admired our mothers. Let me ask you today to think of two or three people other than Jesus you would most like to emulate. What trial, what traits do those individuals exhibit that cause you to think so highly of them? As you're perhaps mentally compiling your list, let me suggest that you consider the name Stephen. He was the first martyr of the Christian faith. In Acts 6, verse 5, Stephen is characterized as a man full of the Holy Spirit. A few verse later, Luke refers to him as a man full of God's grace and power. And then when he was accused of blasphemy and forced to appear before the Sanhedrin to give a defense, Acts 6 verse 15 explains that the religious high court beheld his face like that of an angel. It's safe for us to say that Stephen provides an example for the church. This morning we're going to focus specifically on Acts chapter 7 verse 51 through Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. This is God's word. Acts 7 beginning at verse 51. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So ends the reading of God's word. Stephen provides an example for the church to boldly proclaim Christ. To boldly Proclaim Christ. Consider his message. When he began to speak at the start of chapter 7, Stephen addressed his audience as brethren and fathers. His aim was simply to walk them through the history of Israel and to show them how Jesus was indeed the fulfillment of the law, how Jesus was the fulfillment of the temple, and how Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It became increasingly clear to Stephen, however, that his audience was blind to see and deaf to hear what the Old Testament prophets had foretold. So he shifts from a historical discourse to a direct personal application. And mind you, he does not pull any punches. He calls the Sanhedrin stiff-necked with uncircumcised hearts and ears accurate descriptors because these men continued to resist the Holy Spirit. Take, for instance, a box of O's. I don't know if you know the cereal O's or not. I am partial to O's cereal. I like it because it stays crunchy in milk and, well, it just tastes good. All right? 
And Chamblin, he shares my affinity for old cereal. But Whitman, Whitman never liked it. As a matter of fact, when he was younger, if I would pour a box of old cereal, he would literally get up and leave the room because he would say it smelled so bad. Now, I think it's the same with the gospel. People will taste and see that the Lord is good, or they will find his truth utterly appalling and seek to leave the room. We will either acknowledge that our sin killed the just one, repent of our sin, and be reconciled to God through Jesus' blood, or we will gnash our teeth and plug our ears. The Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Compare Acts 2 verse 37 with Acts 7 verse 54. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter tells his audience that they had both crucified the Lord and Christ, the people were cut to the heart and they asked, what must we do to be saved? Conversely, when Stephen declares essentially the same truth, the people were cut to the heart only as to take up stones. As Christians, we never know how people will respond to the gospel. All we know is that we have been saved to boldly proclaim it. Pastor Joe Novenson of Lookout Mountain Presbyterian Church was once asked to participate in a ministry with a friend who had been converted from Islam to Christianity. His friend um, still lived in his Muslim country and he had begun a ministry and all he did was he would open up the Bible on a street corner and he would read from the, the letters in red, if you would. He would read from the Gospels. And he had invited Joe to come over and see what his ministry looked like and what was going on. And, and so Joe went and he took his oldest son with him. And he was happy to stand on the street corner to, to read from the Gospels. Only as he had been reading for about 10 minutes, um, a man walked over to Joe and told him that serious harm awaited him if he continued to read. Joe said he closed his Bible, he walked around the corner to where his friend was still reading and he told his friend what had happened and he looked at Joe and said, I'm not sure what your Jesus would have you do, but mine would have me stand and preach. Where does boldness like that come from? <laughs> the Holy Spirit. How can I, though, who often lack courage, openly share my faith to somebody who's standing behind me in the grocery line, to somebody who's waiting on me in a restaurant? How can I boldly share my faith with a neighbor who really I rarely speak to? Here again, I think we can further learn from Stephen. You see, Stephen provides an example for the church of our assurance in Christ. Stephen lived in confidence that Jesus had fulfilled the messianic prophecy that Sally read from earlier in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus Christ is given full authority. He's given full power. He's given full dominion in both heaven and on earth. In other words, Stephen knew that there was nothing that man could do to him because Jesus Christ is Lord. And notice how God profoundly blesses Stephen's faith. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazes heavenward to behold Christ standing before the Father. What a powerful image that is if you stop and think about it. It's so powerful. Because scripture attests in multiple places how Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and sat down. He sat down because the work was completed. He sat down because he had done what the Levitical priests could not do. And yet here, scripture says Jesus stands up for Stephen. 
It's as if the victorious king stood to say, that one, dad, that one, he's with me. And if you're a Christian, how can that not embolden you and grant you assurance to know that if we are faithful to stand for Jesus, Jesus stands for us. To have a victorious king stand before the Father and say, that one, Dad, that one, Jim Smallwood, he's with me. That one, Dad, that one, Christina Shepherd, she's with me. That one, Joy Six, she's with me. That one, Jack McAllister, he's with me. That one, and that one, and that one. To be counted as one of those, that ones. He's with me. She's with me. Now maybe it means we die for Christ like Jim Elliott and his cohorts who carried the gospel to a remote Indian tribe. Maybe it means we live uh, like Christ and we stand for the truth of the gospel at risk of being canceled. Whatever it means, Stephen's assurance can be our assurance as well. Death for the Christian is not our end. It is just the beginning. That is why even though the devout men who buried Stephen grieved, they did not grieve as those without hope. Friends, we do not die for nothing. We do not die to nothing. We die to an eternity that awaits us with God. Some of you may know Tim Keller. Um, passed away just a few days ago. You may not know who Tim Keller is, and that's okay too. But Tim Keller is, um, was a pastor um, in New York City for a long, long time, um, ministered to a number of people through his words and through his uh, preaching, through his writing. Um, he said when asked not too long ago what advice he would give to the generation that is before us, and he said this, if Jesus was really raised from the dead, everything is going to be all right. Whatever, whatever you're afraid of, whatever you're worried about, it's going to be all right. You see, because Jesus is risen. And Tim Keller said, the one thing that I know for certain more than ever is that Christ is risen. And that gives comfort to Kathy and me. And it should give comfort to you as well. The confidence of knowing it's going to be all right. Christ is king. Knowing that this life that we live is but just the beginning, we must realize that every life that we come into contact with has eternal value. Listen, every life that we encounter, every person that we meet, their lives, their souls have eternal value. And I suspect that if we believe that, it could very well impact the way that we relate to and deal with other people. Stephen provides an example for the church of loving like Christ. There's been a kind of repetitive theme to some of um, this. I don't know if you've noticed our study through Acts, but I will repeat it again on his way to the cross. Jesus teaches his disciples a new command. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And Christ's love was self-sacrificing. It was um, one that freely forgave. At Calvary, where they crucified King Jesus, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then in pain that we could never even begin to imagine, not just because of the physical pain, but because of the spiritual separation between him and the Father, Jesus' love saw them drive in the nails. Amazing love, how can it be that Christ the King would die for me? And so Luke highlights that Stephen truly understood 
and live by Jesus' new command. Because while a mob pelted him with stones, Stephen cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. A.K.A. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Stephen's prayer shows that he both loved his executioners and that he believed in the pardon of God for even the most hardened of sinners. Yeshu's father had begun a mission in a Hindu-dominated area. And one day a Hindu leader, a prominent Hindu leader, approached Yeshu's father for prayer. And Yeshu's father was excited. He, he was hoping to lead this man to Christ. And so he went into uh, the tent alone with this Hindu leader. And Yeshu shortly thereafter heard screams coming from that tent. And as he walked in, Yeshu's father had been stabbed multiple times by the man. And he ran out the backside of the tent. As he lay dying, Yeshu's father said this to his son, please find that man. And tell him he is forgiven. Care for your mother. Carry on the mission. Do whatever it takes to win people to Christ. This is the type of love Jesus calls us to display. We must stand ready to forgive those, even those who drive in the nails. Those who... Those nails might be stones like the ones that took Stephen's life. Those nails might be knives like the one who took Yesu's father's life. Or those nails might be words someone speaks that damages our spirit so. And yet Jesus says, love as I have loved. And when we love like Jesus and live passionately for his purposes, our lives will significantly impact others for the kingdom of God. When Nea Izzo was sharing this story with me one Sunday, walking out of church, and she asked me if I'd heard it, and I had, and I'm going to share it now, Nea, about John Harper of London, England. From the time Harper placed his trust in Christ as a teenager, his passion was simply to see others reconciled to God. And so in 1912, when the Moody Church of Chicago asked him to lead a revival, Harper was glad to accept. His wife had died a few years prior, so he took with him on the voyage his only child, Nana, age six, and an older cousin. Harper would awaken his little girl at midnight, only a few nights into the journey. The ship, you see, had struck an iceberg. Harper told his daughter that he was going to place her in a lifeboat with her older cousin as a precaution. He, on the other hand, would wait for another rescue boat to arrive. The ship, as I am sure you have surmised, was the Titanic. And we only know what happened to John Harper after he put Nana in that lifeboat because of a prayer meeting that was held in Hamilton, Ontario, several months later. At that meeting, a young Scotsman stood up to explain how he was converted to Christ. You see, he too was on the Titanic that tragic night, and he clung to a floating piece of debris in the freezing waters. And as he did, a wave brought another man by whose name was John Harper. He was also clinging to some debris. Harper cried out, man, are you saved? No, I'm not, the Scotsman replied. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, Harper shouted out. The waves, it says, bore Harper away, but soon again washed him back near the Scotsman. And he said once more, are you saved now? No, answered the young man. And Harper shouted out again, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And those final words, Harper lost his grip on the piece of wood to which he clung and drowned. But at that prayer meeting, the young Scotsman stood up and spoke these words. And there, alone in the night, with two miles of water under me, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I am John Harper's last convert. Harper could not have known 
the way his words would reverberate in that man's heart. How could he? Likewise, Stephen took his last breath, but he could not have known the difference he would make. But Stephen provides an example for the church in making our lives count for Christ. Making our lives count for Christ. In Acts 26, verse 14, Paul, formerly known as Saul, says that the Lord proclaimed to him on the road to Damascus, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. What does that mean exactly? It appears that Stephen's death, in my opinion, was a constant prick at Paul's heart. You see, Saul of Tarsus had gathered the coats of those who stoned Stephen, consenting to his death. Yet being such a devout religious man, albeit profoundly empty inside, Saul, I believe, likely desired to see what Stephen saw when he looked up unto the heavens. Augustine suggests if Stephen had not prayed, the church would not have Paul. It is as if Paul stood before King Agrippa and said, I am Stephen's last convert. In fact, if Paul had ever compiled a list of two or three individuals he most admired, I believe Stephen would have made his list. Only Stephen would never know the impact that he had on Saul. He would never know the impact Paul would have on the kingdom. Stephen could not know. He could not know that his death would be the impetus for carrying out Christ's mission. Remember what Jesus says in Acts 1 verse 8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But it was not until after the great persecution breaks out due to Stephen's death that Christians began to go and began to reach regions beyond Jerusalem. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Luke says Christians were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And then verse 4 testifies that these dispersed believers began to preach the word in those areas. Oh, but it gets even better than that. What was Paul's moniker? What moniker did Paul bear? Paul, apostle to the Gentiles. It was ultimately Paul who led the missionary journeys to the end of the earth. Do you see how Acts 1-8 is being fulfilled? Because Stephen stood for Christ. And his life and his death, oh, did they make a difference. Yes, Yes, it did. Brooke says, I may have shared this with you before. I I don't know. Again, I have children. Um, But I I taught Lewis Coors 11th grade English from 2010 to 2011 at Westminster Christian Academy. He sat in the back row middle. And he was one of those kids, you know, like, I mean, I would give my best lesson ever. And his face would never change. And I'm going, I can't teach better than that. You know? and, and I'm not reaching that kid. So a number of years later, I got a Facebook message from Lewis Coors. He was getting married. Dr. Gibson, I was hoping you would officiate my wedding because I always looked up to you as the type of Christian man I wanted to become. I served as Brad Martin's youth pastor in Louisiana only for one year. And again, he was one of those kids that you would have been hard pressed to convince me that he really paid attention to anything that I said. And then I was in my PhD, PhD program in Deerfield, Illinois, and I get a phone call. This is from Brad Martin. He tracked me down. It wasn't a cell phone at the time. It was like a, a little phone inside the 
dorm where I slept on a top bunk of a bunk bed. So he, he found my phone number somehow at Trinity, called me and said, I just wanted you to know that I'm leading worship to prisoners in local jails now. I wanted to thank you for modeling what it meant to live for Jesus. Now, now, while mine are not remotely close to the magnitude of Stephen's influence, these are the types of stories that give meaning to my life. Each year, I have my senior students reflect on their educational experience. They can take the time to offer constructive criticism, or they can choose to say thank you to teachers who have blessed them in some way along their journey. And when students share positive remarks about individual teachers, I forward those comments along anonymously to those teachers. At MCS, students frequently name one particular teacher as having significantly influenced them and having served as an example for them. I'll just, I'll just tell you, like one of the students wrote a paragraph about this individual and said, I will never forget that when my father was not around, that this man took me to daddy-daughter dance. Um, that's the kind of guy he is. And I shared these paragraphs with him yet again, and he emailed me back these words. There is an older song that has often come to my mind as I have tried imperfectly to point others to Jesus. The lyrics say, will you love Jesus more when we go our different ways? When this moment is a memory, will you remember his face? Will you look back and realize you sensed his love more than you did before? I pray for nothing less than for you to love Jesus more. Corey Penn then said, thankful all day for the opportunities the Lord has brought to us. I like that very much. Are we thankful all day for the opportunities the Lord brings to us to help others love Jesus more. I can think of nothing more impactful and meaningful for one's life than to say, I lived so that others might love Jesus more. That's making your lives count. So, like Stephen, None of us can completely know the impact that our example will have on others and for the kingdom of God. But like Stephen, I want to encourage you today to strive to make your lives count for Christ. That, I believe, is the prime example for the church.